Around 5.30 p.m. on Sunday, Caroline came in through the front door, casually tossing her purse and keys onto the nightstand before heading straight down the hallway to our master bedroom. I couldn't be sure if she noticed me sitting in the office, but it hardly mattered. Over the years, I've practically faded into the background for her. I walked over, grabbed her set of keys, swapped them for my spare ones, and then started rifling through her purse. I pulled out her cell phone and wallet, taking out all the cash and credit cards and slipping them into my pocket just to be on the safe side. I also snagged her driver's license before returning to my spot in the office. Fifteen minutes later, Caro came out of the hallway looking polished and put together, spotting me right away. As she slung her purse over her shoulder and grabbed her keys, she said, I'm heading out to meet some friends from work. Don't wait up. I shot back. No, you're not just going out with work friends. You're seeing your boyfriend, so don't try to lie to me. Caroline, taking a moment to process, boldly marched into the office and faced me head on. All right, Henry, I'd rather we handled this differently, but let's cut to the chase. You've got two choices. Either you let me have some freedom and salvage what's left of this marriage, or you can face a divorce and be cut out of my life entirely. What's it going to be? With a smirk, I replied, I'll take door number three. Don't be childish. There isn't a door number three. You either accept that I have a lover now, a real man, or deal with the consequences, Caroline warned, her voice carrying a menacing edge. I stood up, walked over to Caro, and pushed her against the wall, taking off her engagement ring and wedding bands. With my face inches from hers and anger burning in my eyes, I whispered, Here's your door number three. It's my front door. When you walk through it, it'll be the last time you leave with anything, and you won't be coming back. You'll lose your husband, your daughter, your house, your money, your car, and eventually, your job. You're living in a fantasy, Henry, she muttered nervously. My lawyer will tear you apart tomorrow. I'll send the divorce papers to your workplace. If you try to harm me, you'll end up suffering more than I will. I yanked her away from the wall and dragged her toward the front door her heels clacking as she stumbled and screamed incoherently. Caro fought to keep her balance, her poise crumbling. I'd never laid a hand on her during our marriage, and she was at a loss for how to react. Once she began to regain her composure in the front yard, I shut and locked the door, having already replaced the lock earlier that day. Earlier before Caro left, I made the first of two important calls. I dialed my 19-year-old daughter's number at college. Hey, it's Dad. Things with your mom have reached a breaking point. Looks like she's moving in with her boyfriend, and I need to talk to you about it. I've recorded our last conversation and many past arguments. Feel free to listen so you know the truth if she tries to twist things and blame me, which she probably will. The reality is that your mom's been cheating. I'm not sure how many times, but she's chosen this guy over us. I'll explain more soon, but her boyfriend seems pretty shady, so be cautious about your relationship with her. I then reached out to Emily asking her to come home for the weekend. My plan was to talk things over and give her a chance to listen to the tapes if she wanted. Fortunately, Emily agreed to come home on Friday. After finalizing that, I called Alice, our neighbor down the block. Alice, it's Henry, I said when she answered. If your offer is still good, I'd like to take you up on it. Could you come over in about an hour? I kept my explanation brief, feeling the need to confide in Alice. Caro and I had met young, gotten married, and soon had Emily. Things seemed fine at first, but Caro's behavior quickly soured. She became irritable, manipulative, and controlling. I tried my best to keep the peace and make her happy, but it only seemed to make matters worse. Reflecting on it now, I realized that my constant efforts to please her contributed to my own misery. Now, in our forties, our lives were in chaos. It wasn't long before I discovered Caro's affair with a man named Victor, or Vic, who had a violent background. The realization that our marriage was beyond saving brought me some relief, and I started planning my next moves. I'd heard stories of husbands taking half the money, but I wasn't about to do that. I took every penny I could find, including all the cash in the house. I changed the locks and planned to provoke Caro as much as possible, knowing her well enough to predict her reactions. She's dangerous in many ways, but this time, she'd be a danger to herself as well. In fact, I'd been preparing for this long before discovering Caro's affair. For years, I had been secretly recording our arguments. 
Caro thought the device I carried around was a simple MP3 player, but in reality, I was building a library of her outbursts to document her behavior. I knew no one would believe my side of the story without proof, since Caro only mistreated me behind closed doors. I wanted to make sure I could share my experiences with everyone, including Emily, to reveal Caro's true nature. On the Monday following our argument, I threw a little celebration in the company break room. A big banner declared happy divorce overhead. With cake and ice cream ready, I eagerly awaited the arrival of the process server. Fortunately, it was a pleasantly plump young woman handling the delivery. My coworkers and I snapped plenty of photos as we celebrated receiving the divorce papers. I even took a picture of myself accepting the papers, planting a kiss on the server's cheek while she wore a festive hat. In another shot, I playfully fed her a piece of cake, and we both smiled for the camera. After the celebration, I sent the photos to Caro, along with some from the party, including a few of Alice and me lounging in bed with the sheets pulled up, both of us grinning. I hoped Caro would see her wedding rings on Alice's hand, resting on my chest. About an hour later, I received a furious call from Caro. You scoundrel! My lawyer will rip you apart after seeing these photos. What a foolish move, she fumed. Hardly, Caro. There's nothing inappropriate in those pictures. No nudity, just harmless fun between neighbors, I countered. We'll talk about this later. I'll be out of the house this evening. If you need to pick up anything, be there before 6.45. Alice and I have plans at 7, and I don't want to be late. Last night was the closest I've felt to true satisfaction in a long time. Tonight promises to be even better, I added before ending the call and ignoring her subsequent five attempts to reach me. Although I hadn't answered all her calls, I listened to every voicemail. Unlike other men in my situation, I was hopeful that Carol might slip up or reveal something incriminating in her angry messages. And she did, several times over the next few weeks. At 4.30 that afternoon, I drove to Caro's workplace parking lot, aiming to get there before the evening rush. Checking to make sure there were no security cameras, I quickly set about my task. Pulling up next to Caro's car, I used wire cutters to slice through the valve stems on all her tires. I knew she'd be furious, and with her tires damaged, she wouldn't be able to fix them in time to get home by 6.45. Sure enough, around 6.35, she showed up, clearly having been out with someone and anxious to get home. Given the receipts for clothing she hadn't brought back, I figured she must have left plenty at her lover's place. It seemed she was after something more. Slipping out the back, I hurried over to Alice's house, leaving Caro pounding on the front door and yelling. When I returned that evening, I found my front window shattered with blood smeared around it. After reviewing the porch security footage, I called the police. The video showed Caro smashing the window with a tire iron and making clear threats to harm me. Unfortunately for her, the new lock I'd installed required a key from both sides. As she tried to break in, she cut her forearm deeply, causing more screams and threats. I reported the incident, and an officer helped me file a restraining order. The next morning, Caro was served with papers prohibiting her from coming within 500 feet of me or our home. To say she was enraged would be an understatement. What in the world are you doing, you idiot? She began in her next call, her fury and threats renewed. I meticulously recorded the entire conversation. A few hours later, after she had calmed down somewhat, she called again, mentioning that she would send her friend Samantha to collect some of her belongings that evening. I couldn't help but wonder what she was so desperate to retrieve from the house. With growing suspicion, I agreed to meet Samantha at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday. To prepare, I left work a bit early and set up a video camera in my bedroom, with a monitor discreetly installed in my office. Samantha arrived right on time, and I greeted her warmly. While she packed some clothes into two black plastic trash bags, I sat on the bed, keeping an eye on her. Samantha seemed nervous, and soon asked for water from the kitchen. I smiled and went to get it. As I glanced at the monitor, I saw Samantha pulling a shoebox from the closet and adding it to one of the bags. When she returned with the water, she continued packing. She said it should be enough and asked me to take one bag while she took the other, noting that her bag seemed heavier. I offered to help, but she refused, insisting she was fine, and asked me to grab another bag. As she started fidgeting and heading towards the door with her package, I asked if there was anything in it I should be aware of. I grabbed her wrist and opened the package to find stacks of worn $50 and $100 bills. 
Confronting her about the smell coming from the box, I accused her of attempting to steal from me. Samantha insisted the money belonged to Caro and that she was just sent to collect it, denying any intention of theft. I pointed out that Samantha came to my house supposedly to collect clothes, but was leaving with a box of money, which I considered theft. I threatened to call the police and have her arrested for robbery. Samantha, desperate and worried about her family, begged me not to involve the authorities. I had her sit on the couch and told her how disappointed I was, making it clear she would never be welcome in my home again. Despite her tears and pleas, I said she had one chance to make amends. She had to leave, inform Caro that I caught her stealing, and report everything she heard or saw about the divorce or Caro's relationship with Vic. I made it clear that if she cooperated, I had the entire incident on video and could report her to the police at any time. Reluctantly, Samantha agreed to be my informant. Once Samantha left, I took the box of money and walked over to Alice's house at the end of the block. She agreed to hide it for me until I could find a secure place for it out of Caro's reach. I suspected the money came from Caro's late Aunt Helen, who had been notoriously frugal. Aunt Helen had passed away a few months earlier, leaving Caro as her only heir. While I knew Aunt Helen had left Caro a small cottage, there was no mention of any cash. It seemed that during her visit to the cabin after the will reading, Caro must have found her aunt's hidden stash of cash. When Caro called, furious and shouting, I recorded the conversation carefully. This money is mine, Henry. I want my damn money, she screamed. Caro, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I caught Samantha trying to steal money from my nightstand, I replied. You know exactly what I'm referring to. The money in the shoebox is mine. It's from Aunt Helen she retorted. Maybe Samantha found some money in a shoebox, but if so, she likely took it and kept it for herself. I don't have it, and if you had money here unknown to me, you didn't report it on your taxes last year. I've reviewed our tax returns. Feel free to involve the police, and then we'll inform the IRS about this money and let them handle your tax evasion. I shot back before she hung up. Feeling the need for retaliation, I realized Kara was too volatile to just disappear. Restricted by a restraining order from approaching her house, I anticipated she might retaliate against me through my car, especially since I had already vandalized hers. To prepare, I installed a dashboard-mounted camera, but it didn't seem sufficient. If she chose to target my car, I needed clear footage. So on Wednesday morning, I set up an exterior camera in front of the garage. Discreetly positioned, it streamed video to my desk and was accessible an hour before lunch. I watched on my laptop as Caro parked behind my car, got out, and began smashing it with a hammer. She shattered windows and dented panels with a fury that made my spine tingle. I quickly dialed emergency services, and a police car was on the scene by the time she left my driveway. Presenting the video footage of my damaged Toyota, the police arrested Caro, charging her with criminal vandalism and adding a resisting arrest charge. As she was led away, her pleading eyes met my silent, unyielding stare. On Wednesday, Caro's divorce lawyer called me to inform me of a court hearing set for Thursday at 10 a.m. regarding the money withdrawn from our joint accounts. I arrived at the courthouse at 9.50, wondering if Caro had managed to post bail. She walked in with her lawyer wearing a smug expression. Her lawyer addressed the judge. Your Honor, my client was denied access to the shared bank accounts. After filing for divorce, her husband illicitly emptied them. We're requesting a 50. 50 split. Yes, Your Honor, my wife, who has been unfaithful, has been withdrawing her own funds from our joint accounts for months. The money I withdrew was fair compensation, given that I cover rent and bills. She abandoned our marriage to be with her affair partner, I responded. Caro stood up, objecting. That's not true. He drained our savings and checking accounts, leaving me with nothing. Her lawyer intervened, guiding her back to her seat for a brief conference while I presented documents to the judge. Your Honor, these bank statements cover the past year. They show Caro's salary up until a few months ago, along with periodic bonuses. Six months ago, her deposits stopped, including bonuses. I have a recorded conversation with her HR confirming that her direct deposit was switched to her personal account. The total amount diverted from our joint account is substantial. It's clear that my unfaithful wife has significant assets acquired during our marriage. The judge examined the bank statements and then turned to Caroline. The judge turned to Caro. 
Do you have any response, Miss Smith? Her lawyer stood up hesitantly. Your Honor, regardless of any personal funds my client might have, Mr. Smith is still legally obligated to ensure she receives her fair share. Counselor, I don't tolerate dishonesty. Miss Smith came into court claiming financial ruin, yet here she is with you, indicating financial support for marital assets. It's clear she's misled both her husband and this court. Since Mr. Smith has been managing expenses from his own funds, there's no reason to adjust the current financial arrangements. We'll address property division in the final divorce decree. Case dismissed. As I exited the courtroom, Caro cornered me in the hallway. I began documenting her threats meticulously. Caro, you're breaching the restraining order. I'll notify the police if you don't leave. And by the way, how was jail? Ready for another stay? You're facing criminal charges. Despite her anger and clenched fists, I continued walking away. She stood there, fuming, but I made my exit. Later that night, I visited a bar where I had previously met a man named Cal. To my relief, he was there. I greeted him and asked if he remembered me. He replied that my name wasn't important. Cal then expressed his frustration with his old beat-up car, lamenting that his wife had taken the better one when she left with her new lover. He complained about the broken air conditioning and his inability to afford a replacement. I inquired about his car insurance and suggested that if he followed my advice, he might end up with something better. Cal, intrigued, indicated he was listening. Imagine you're driving down 38th Street and a gray cat suddenly leaps in front of you. Naturally, you slam on the brakes and the car behind you might rear-end your dilapidated vehicle at high speed. Your car could end up totaled, but if you're securely buckled in and braced, you should be all right. Insurance will handle the repairs. Plus, you might be able to afford a car with air conditioning. What if the person who hits me gets hurt? I can't do that to her. Rest assured, the driver will be an unfaithful spouse and there won't be anyone else in her car if you follow my instructions. What do you think? That sounds fantastic. I can't stand cheaters and I definitely need to get rid of this car. Where should I go? Park at the corner of 38th and Lessing by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Look for a blue Miata leaving the parking lot and heading your way. Pull out in front of it. She hates passing other cars so drive a block or so until she's tailing you. Then slam on the brakes. Just stay in the car afterward. Call emergency and report a possible neck injury. And remember, we've never met, and I won't be returning to this bar. We don't know each other. On Friday, I left work early to meet my daughter at home. As planned, she finished her classes and returned that evening. We discussed the divorce situation, and I played her a recording of my conversation with her mother about door number three. Emily was stunned by her mother's ruthless tone and demands. I also shared recordings from the past two years, revealing a side of Caro she had never seen. What do you know about the guy mom's with? Dad, I know he's trouble, and I want you to stay away from him. If you have to meet your mom, make sure it's in a public place. I don't know what he's capable of. Always be prepared to protect yourself if you suspect he might be around. Emily, I knew your mom and I had our issues but I never realized the extent of it. What went wrong between us? This question was anticipated, so I provided Emily with a simplified explanation. I told her that her mother and I had fundamentally different views on marriage. Reflecting on our relationship, I identified four ways power can be distributed. No leadership. Neither partner takes charge, resulting in a relationship that drifts aimlessly, like a rudderless ship. Constant power struggles. Both partners vie for control, leading to endless disputes over dominance or splitting responsibilities. Equal partnership. Some couples share responsibility equally, which was my initial expectation. However, this didn't work out as planned. One partner in control. This scenario involves one partner taking full control. While it can work in specific situations, it's often seen as outdated and oppressive. If a man is deeply committed to his wife, it can resemble a fairy tale romance offering a fulfilling life. Alternatively, it can mirror your maternal grandparents' dynamic, where the grandmother was passive and the grandfather was dominant and sometimes harsh. Your mother likely grew up expecting this type of dynamic. When I tried to share equal footing, she saw it as weakness, leading to increasing disrespect despite my efforts to please her. This leads me to the final scenario. In a relationship where the wife takes charge, things can spiral quickly. It seemed that your mom chose to dominate. 
When I didn't meet her exacting standards, she became increasingly harsh. She dictated every project, micromanaging every detail, and many initiatives ended up incomplete because I couldn't bear to feel undermined in my own home. She even gave me detailed instructions on how to handle tools while working, which became unbearable. When a wife takes the lead to such an extreme, it disrupts the natural order of a relationship. While a husband might still be affectionate, the wife often loses respect for him as she takes control. I believe this dynamic has been at the root of our issues. As I began to resist her authority, Caroline saw it as a sign of weakness. By then, she already viewed me as inadequate. My attempts to assert myself were interpreted as rebelliousness. Regaining her respect seems impossible at this point. This divorce may be my final chance to reclaim it. I explained to Emily that she would understand my actions once she grasped how difficult it was to challenge her mother's domineering lifestyle. I advised her that mutual respect should be a cornerstone in any significant relationship, such as starting a family or making major life decisions. Both partners need to have a clear understanding to avoid the unhappy situation Caroline and I found ourselves in. Emily assured me she would keep my advice in mind and promised to reflect on it. Shortly after, the phone rang. Mr. Smith, this is Memorial Hospital. Your wife was involved in a car accident. She's stable and not severely injured, but she'll be staying with us at least overnight. Emily and I drove to the hospital. I let her go in first. After she came out looking somber, I suspected she had confronted Caroline harshly. Wow, Caro, you look awful, I said with a slight smirk. What a week you've had, losing your marriage, husband, and home. Then, a restraining order and a felony arrest. Now, your car's totaled and you're here with a broken wrist and a bruised face from the airbag. This divorce is turning out much better for me. Freak you, she spat back. Oh, Caro, where's that old charm of yours? Still busy with your other men, I suppose. You probably didn't know about them when this all started, did you? But now you do. I wonder how long before he's done with you and you end up serving one of his other women. I never took you for a people pleaser, but you might need that skill in prison. I'm not going to jail. My lawyer will clear these false charges. Really? You think you'll get off easy after crashing my car and endangering my health? The DA is determined to make an example of you. He's got photographic evidence and an election coming up. He'll push for the maximum sentence. Caro stared at me, silent. By the way, did you arrange for car insurance? I asked. Car insurance? What are you talking about? Didn't you get insurance when you filed for divorce? I removed your car from my policy. If you didn't get new insurance, you're in big trouble. Expect fines, towing fees, and possibly three years of payments. Your Miata might end up as scrap while you're still paying for it. Plus, with a felony conviction, you might not need another car. You'll also likely face medical bills for the person you hit, and their insurance will demand compensation. Damn it. But I have my own medical insurance, right? No, I removed you from my health insurance on Monday. Didn't you handle that? You're in serious trouble. The ambulance ride, ER visit, x-rays, doctor's fees, cast, hospital stay, and follow-up care will cost a fortune. Speaking of medical care, I continued, remember when you were sick a couple of years ago? I took a week off to care for you. I held your head while you vomited, cleaned up after you, and went to the pharmacy for your medication. And then a week later, you went right back to scolding me and calling me names. I wonder how well Vic will take care of you when you're sick. It's time for me to call Vic, I said, since you think he's done with his other woman. I wish you well. As I left, Caroline sat there, tears streaming down her face. I felt indifferent. Life went on as usual. I kept in touch with Samantha occasionally. She became increasingly concerned about Vic's influence over Caro and gradually distanced herself from her. One evening, as I approached my front door, I was caught off guard by a sudden attack on my lawn. Despite being vigilant about potential threats, this one was unexpected. A man in a ski mask knocked me down, twisted my arm behind my back, and demanded that I hand over a box of money and convince the DA to drop the charges. Helpless, I still had the car alarm remote in my hand. I hit the panic button, setting off the alarm. Enraged, the attacker struck me again before fleeing as my neighbor's porch lights flickered on and people began to peer outside. I yelled for someone to call emergency services and a police officer arrived within minutes. Fortunately, I wasn't injured severely enough to require an ambulance, and by then, the attacker was long gone. None of my neighbors could identify him, 
so he escaped without facing any consequences. The next day, I broke the news to my daughter, Emily. Dad, I didn't want to tell you, but I had an encounter with Vic, she said hesitantly. Mom asked me to visit her. I agreed, but only if we met somewhere other than his apartment. When I arrived, she asked me to pick her up, but she ended up bringing me to their place. Vic came out and told me that since Mom wasn't coping well with her injuries, I'd have to take care of his needs. He said Mom owed him, and I had to make up for it. I looked at Mom, and she just stared at the floor, saying nothing. Vic grabbed my wrist and tried to drag me to the bedroom. I had pepper spray in my purse, so I used it on him. He yelled and covered his face while I tried to pull Mom out, but she resisted and went towards him, so I left. I can't believe Mom tried to set me up with him, Emily continued, her voice trembling. I don't know if I can ever forgive her for this. I was infuriated, as any father would be. I considered grabbing my Beretta from the bedroom in a moment of rage. After a while, Emily reassured me that she wasn't harmed and urged me to focus on the future. I made her promise not to walk alone until after the trial and to always carry protection. She agreed to only date fellow students and to avoid being alone in public. Gradually, I regained my composure. Vic was eager for me to speak with the DA, but he didn't anticipate the conversation I had. I presented a recording of Emily's ordeal and reminded the DA of Vic's assault on me. The DA asked if I would consider leniency for Caro or dropping the charges. I refused outright. I insisted on pursuing the maximum penalty. Caro was under Vic's control, and separating them was the only way to help her. The district attorney agreed that prison might be the wake-up call Caro needed, and the trial moved forward. At home and work, I felt relatively secure, though there were moments of vulnerability, particularly when entering or leaving the garage. My commute was a different story. Our house is about 10 miles down a ranch road, with only one turnoff in the next 15 miles, so I was always on edge. One evening, a few days before Caro's trial, I noticed a pickup truck's headlights behind me, sending a shiver down my spine. The truck aggressively tailgated me, staying just 20 feet from my rear bumper, traveling at 55 miles per hour. I called emergency services and activated my phone's voice recorder. As I accelerated to 70 miles per hour, the truck kept pace. I urgently asked the operator to contact the detective handling my assault case. The truck followed me for another five miles as I narrated the situation. With my Beretta beside me, I braced for trouble. As I approached a bridge over a small creek bed, I suspected the truck would try to force me off the road. About a hundred yards from the bridge, the truck accelerated, clearly aiming to push me off. I glimpsed Caro's face in the passenger seat as it pulled alongside me. I slammed on the brakes, skidding but maintaining control. The truck stopped ahead and my car slid to a halt by the roadside, resting on a slope down to the creek bed. I exited the car, grabbed my weapon, phone, and recorder, and made my way down the steep gravel slope beneath the bridge. In the darkness, I carefully navigated, concerned about potential dangers, including rattlesnakes. I found a secure hiding spot and waited anxiously, but there was no sound for a while. My phone lost contact with emergency services, and my attempts to redial failed due to poor reception. I was left in uncertainty, unsure if help was coming. The ominous growl of the truck overhead was gone. I resolved to stay put, prepared to wait out the night if necessary. It felt like an eternity, but it was likely only five or ten minutes before I heard the distant sound of sirens approaching. Realizing they were still far behind, I began climbing the hill, leaving the Beretta hidden under the bridge. As I reached the road, I raised my hands, desperately signaling to the incoming police not to shoot. I saw two police cars blocking both lanes and heard sirens coming from the other direction. Through the haze, I saw the pickup truck heading back towards the bridge. I stumbled and fell into the mud, my vision obscured, but I heard the truck screech to a halt and officers shouting at the driver to get out and lie on the ground. Other police vehicles soon arrived, and Vic and Caro were taken into custody on charges of attempted murder. Despite my deep concern, I returned home, showered, and tried to sleep, but sleep eluded me. With Caro facing multiple felonies, the divorce seemed almost simple by comparison. The judge showed sympathy, and Caro's lawyer offered little resistance. In a desperate bid to reduce her prison time, Caro agreed to concede nearly everything in the divorce. During the sentencing, I testified about Caro's past virtues before Vic's influence corrupted her. 
I spoke of my willingness to forgive her eventually for her attempt on my life. I chose not to mention her possible infidelity or years of torment. Her expression in court was unreadable, and I didn't speak directly to her. Vic received a lengthy prison sentence, and I hoped he'd end up sharing a cell with a particularly tough inmate. The judge showed some leniency towards Caro, but she would not be eligible for parole for at least three years. It's been about four years since Caro was imprisoned. I recently learned from the DA's office that she had been granted parole about a year ago. Despite my anticipation, I had not heard from her, and she hadn't reached out to Emily. Revenge seemed tempting, but ultimately unsatisfying. I couldn't stop replaying the past events in my mind. Unexpectedly, I decided to reach out to Caro. Caro, it's Henry. I have something of yours and I want to return it, I said over the phone. The rehab center where Kara was staying didn't respond immediately. Caroline, I want to give you a shoebox. Can we arrange a meeting so I can return it to you? I was ready for her to hang up, but eventually she agreed. Where, when, I don't care, she said. We decided to meet at a neutral location like a restaurant, or she could come to my house. I suggested Sunday. At 2 p.m. on Sunday, the phone rang. How does one prepare to face their ex-wife, the mother of their child, the woman who once tried to kill them? and a convicted felon. I prepared lemonade and cookies. When Caro arrived, there was no attempt at shaking hands or hugging. We exchanged brief greetings, and I directed her to my office. Her hair was much shorter, her face lacked makeup, and at 50, she looked considerably older. There were drinks, cookies, and a shoebox on the coffee table. Caro sat down on the opposite sofa and declined the soft drinks. Was she really so suspicious that she thought I might poison her? If you don't want lemonade and cookies, then all you need is the shoebox and whatever else we need to discuss, I said. What's the catch, Henry? What do you want instead? Is there anything left? She asked, still wary. There's no trick, Caro. Everything is there except for a few thousand dollars I contributed, which I gave to Emily as a down payment on her house when she got married. If you want, she can start returning your share to you whenever you like. I simply gave her my portion. From Caro's reaction, it was clear she didn't know Emily was married. Emily's been married for two years, and you're already a grandmother. Her daughter's name is Olivia Caroline Harris, named after her other grandmother. Caro's eyes welled up with tears, despite her efforts to stay composed. I know you haven't been in touch with Emily. If you want, I can help facilitate reconnecting with her, I offered. Caro nodded, tears streaming down her face. I handed her the box of tissues I'd prepared. I'll give you the short version of our story if you're not in a hurry to leave, I said gently. She wiped her tears and tried to steady herself. Emily found a wonderful guy named Tom Harris. He works in computers and networks. They really click. She's a fantastic mom, and they're deeply committed to each other. Alice and I didn't last long. She was too young for me and needed me temporarily until she got her life back on track. She moved on with someone else. I date occasionally but end things if it gets too serious. I'm better off alone. We sat in silence for a moment. I'm going to share some thoughts, mainly for my own benefit, but maybe you can take something from them too. I hope so. I couldn't wait to see you in prison. I hated you and wished you were dead many times. But when they locked you up, my feelings began to shift. I couldn't savor my victory anymore. I let go of my hatred for you, even though you never asked for it. I forgave you because I know you're not entirely to blame. I couldn't understand you until it was too late, and we just bickered. Caro looked up from the floor, her face still etched with pain. That's the truth, plainly and simply. If you have nothing more to say, and if you're not hungry, I won't keep you any longer. You probably have important things to do. She stood up, taking the shoebox as she headed for the door. For the first time since I pushed her away years ago, I called out to her. Caro, it doesn't matter now. And you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I'm curious. Did you ever think I was a pushover, especially on that last day you were here? She paused with her hand on the doorknob and glanced back at me. With bitterness, she said she hated me and believed I had been cruel, accusing me of ruining her life. After a moment of pause, she added that she didn't consider me a pushover. Then, without another word, she disappeared from my life for good.